Good morning. This weekend, I spent a little bit of time on social media, not much, but I was, it was actually not the weekend, it, I mean, it was just last night, really, really late last night. I was trying to, uh, well, I won't tell you why, but uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, well, my, my son was at the homecoming, I was trying to see if there were any pictures showing up, you know, if you're, if you're a weird dad like me, you want to see if there are any pictures showing up, so I was, I was scrolling through social media, and I, I landed on my oldest son, he's a uh, uh, he's now 28, I think. Um, anyway, he, uh, I, true it. And so I, I, I went on, onto his social media uh, feed, his Instagram feed, and I um, went all the way to the, to, to the beginning. I wanted to see like what he was posting on Instagram way back, this would have been in 2012. And so I, I found this photo, and it's so relevant to what we're talking about today. This is, uh, this is, I don't even know what you call it because we don't deal in paper anymore in the in the uh, world of academia. But this was like a score, a great, I guess, a grade card from Daisy May Danner. This is uh, this would this would this was Truett's great grandmother, uh, my grandmother on my father's side, uh, uh, and her name was Daisy. This is clearly she wasn't married yet. I don't know if you can make it out, but this is 1931. And this was at Panhandle A&M College in Goodwell, Oklahoma. I looked it up. There's still a there's still a Panhandle College. It goes by like Oklahoma Panhandle State or something like that. There's a clearly a some kind of a community college, or they may be offended if I say it that way, but it was a small college. And uh, so Daisy Mae Danner, um, she she took this class in the summer of 1931. She got an A. Uh, it was two hour credit. And uh, it, if you can read, uh, if you can make out the subject, it's agronomy 10B. And then in, the, in parentheses, it says livestock. What's so interesting about this to me is that Truett was posting this on Instagram his senior year in college. And then he went off to, to, uh, to Texas Tech in Lubbock. And, and he, as many of you know, he studied wildlife biology, uh, an offshoot of, 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 of this agronomy and agriculture. He studied the wild, wildlife biology and got... got continued on in school, and now he's a wildlife biologist in Alaska. And, and so this, this sort of dotted line, at least, that goes from way back in 31 when my grandmother was still single and she was going off to college, which was pretty unco- an uncommon thing back then, uh, going off to college and study, studying in the field of agriculture, and then many decades later, her great-grandson, uh, some others are correlation there. Some there, some there's a connection there, at least in my mind. It, it's interesting, um, you know, for a guy like Truett when he's 17 years old back then, um, but for any of us to kind of look at our origin, our, our genesis, the people from whom we have, have come, and how they mold us and, and shape us, and it's really interesting. Uh, I'm sure many of you have experienced the same thing. When you look back several generations to some people that you don't even know, like in, the, in this post, Truett said, this is my grandpa's mama. Like he didn't even have, like it's your great grandma, but he didn't even know her. Like he didn't even know exactly what to call her, you know. But it's interesting when you look back several generations to people that you didn't know, and you realize how in some ways you're just like them for good and sometimes for bad, right? But when we look at our, our genesis or our origin, it, it's always really fascinating to me. So last week, we, we, uh, we began this sermon series uh, out of the book of Matthew. And if you remember, it said, this is the genealogy of Jesus. And then we read, and actually, if you weren't here, you missed it. I actually preached, hopefully, a, a somewhat credible sermon um, out of the genealogy. Uh, verses. And such so we did last week. And we had this word uh, genealogy, which it really is, you can hear the, you can hear the similarity. It's, it's quite akin to the word genesis. You know, your beginning, how you began, your, your genesis. Well, today we're going all the way to, uh, we're going to start with verse 18, where we left off last week. And if you can put that up, um, we, we've got, we've got almost the same word when you look at the original language. Today we're going to talk about this is how 
the birth of Jesus came about. But that word, I mean, we're, we're, we're right in translating this word birth in verse 1, uh, translating the word to, to mean genealogy, but actually the words are way more similar than that. Genesis and Genesis, and they're, they're really talking about the Genesis. Uh, in, in verse 1, it said, here's the Genesis of Jesus, and then he laid it out with so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so. And now, Matthew's just going to do it a different way today. Started with verse 18, and he, once again, he uses this word, Genesis, and he says, Here, and here's another way of looking at the, the Genesis, the beginning, the origin of Jesus. And the way he's going to do it today, while last week he developed the genesis of Jesus by giving us all the names of his forefathers and, and, and foremothers, uh, today he's going to do it a different way. He's going to tell the story, interestingly, of Joseph, of Jesus' adopted daddy. Because this is a man who God chose who God the Father ordained to, to be the earthly dad of Jesus. And just like my grandmother, Truett's great-grandmother, and then his grandfather, and then his father, have all shaped Truett to be the man that he is, there's no doubt that, that Joseph was instrumental in shaping this this, this God-man, the, the, this, this, this little boy who grew up into a man, Jesus Christ. So that's what we're looking at today, uh, and uh, I think it's somewhat surprising that even though this account begins with, uh, here's the story of Jesus, it really is not going to tell you today. We're not going to read about the, the birth of Jesus in any great detail. It's really the story of Joseph the carpenter. All right, let's, let's read through it. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, all of the, all of the underlying, uh, underlinings today are, 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 are my doing for emphasis because these are some things we're going to talk about today. So you can kind of hang on these underlined phrases. She was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. And this is what the prophet said. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which is a, a, it's a, it's, it's a quote out of the book of Isaiah. They'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. All right, so this whole passage starts with this next slide. It starts with this, this phrase, this is how the birth of Jesus came about. And yet, as I've already said, Matthew isn't really going to unpack detail by detail, but rather he's going to give us a glimpse of the heart of, his, of, the, of, the heart of God for his people throughout time. 
See, as we read this story and we look at how God deals with, with Mary, but, but, but mostly in this passage, how God deals with Joseph, then what every one, of, every one of us in this room, both men and women, can take from this is, okay, that is how God deals lovingly with his children. The way in which God interacts with Joseph in this story is the way that God will interact with you as you open up your heart to him. So it explains that. It explains Jesus' origin and explains his name. And I've got seven summary statements out of this passage today, and they're not chronologically oriented, but I've got seven statements that I want us to unpack today. The first one is this. I'm going to say this, and we all act like we understand what this means, and none of us do fully, but let's, let's try. This first statement is this. Jesus was from the Holy Spirit. It says that twice in, in this, this brief uh, section of verses that we read, that Jesus was from the Holy Spirit. Well, what do we know that to mean? We at least know it to mean that Joseph was not Jesus biological dad. Some of the best dads that I've known in my life have, have been dads who were not actually the biological dad of the child, but nonetheless, he was a good daddy. And we know that of, of Joseph. So, some of the best um, moms I, I know personally are not the biological mom but they excel as moms nonetheless. And, and, and Joseph was that kind of dad. So Jesus was from, it says, the Holy Spirit. Mary is a, is a, a virgin, and that which is conceived in Mary is from the Holy Spirit. Now, I say that like I get that, and I just want to admit fully that that is a mystery, and yet I want us to try right now to, to, to lean in and to understand a little more fully what that means, and more importantly, uh, understand more fully the significance of it, why we should continue to hold to that truth in the 21st century as Christians. It, it's saying the passage is saying that Mary's pregnancy was, was, was spirit-born, or I hesitate to use this phrase, but spirit-conceived. Um, I hesitate to use it because what it could mean and, and what I actually mean when I say that. You see, in this story, there is no... Uh, there is no uh, raunchiness, there's no sexual overtones. Um, it, it's, not like a, it's not like a promiscuous, the, the promiscuous mythological stories uh, that we, we have from ancient times of ancient mythological gods coming down and having sex with humans. It's not, it's not there's, there's, no, there's no sexual overtones in the writings, in the biblical accounts of this at, at all. So in other words, uh, this means that the incarnation of Christ did not involve in any way, including Joseph, in any way did not involve sexual intercourse. But somehow mysteriously, the Holy Spirit caused Mary to be pregnant with child, specifically to be pregnant with the Messiah, the Christ child. So people ask all the time, people ask me this question, it's a legitimate question. Pastor Randy, does that really matter that much? And, and, and as, as a biblical scholar, you, as a theologian yourself, you should wrestle with that. You should decide that for yourself. I want you to know that as your pastor, for me, that is a significant truth. I say yes to that question. And here's why. Because I believe within the mystery of the, the virgin birth, 
if you, like an onion, unwrap that layer, then what you come to is the mystery of the incarnation of Christ. It's a big word. We, I use it often here, but let's, let's remind one another what that means, the incarnation of Christ. It means that, that, that God, the incarnation of Christ, means that God incarnated himself. Well, that's not much more helpful. So what does it mean that God incarnated himself? It means that, that God became a human being without giving up any of his godness. He didn't trade one for the other. Now, Philippians does say that, that Jesus traded uh, his, his royalty uh, for humility. It does say that, but it does not in any way imply that he gave up any of his godness. So the incarnation of Christ, God incarnating himself, means that God became a human being. As Eugene Peterson says, Peterson says he, he moved in to our neighborhood. And so when, when we, when we, when we, when we uh, unpack or uh, un uh, peel off that first layer of the, the, the virgin birth, then we come to the next beautiful layer, which is the incarnation of Christ, God becoming one of us. Philippians 2 says it really well. It says, Jesus being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by, became, by, by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Now, now sometimes when you're trying to, to determine as a theologian yourself, what does it mean that, that, that he was in very nature God, but he didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped? I believe this is the, the New International Version. As you know, I use lots of different English translations, but I believe this to be the, the NIV. So um, what's good for you to do is when you wonder, like, what did that mean? Because maybe that sounds like something that I didn't think it meant, then it's good in that case to, to go to the English Standard Version and, and go to the New Living uh, uh, translation. Maybe go to the New American Standard and just look at all the different, if, if you don't have uh, actual uh, uh, Greek translation uh, resources at your fingertips, which there's some of those as well that you can get. Uh, but it's good to say, okay, what does that mean? Because this, this is an important verse. It's somewhat of compl uh, a complex verse. So go and look. And I'll tell you that as you really study it, from different English translations. And then even more importantly, if you go and you look at the actual Greek, what you realize is this is saying that Jesus didn't give up any of his godness. He held on to his divinity, but he took on this humanity um, parallel with his divinity. So the incarnation of Christ is unlike any occurrence before or since Simply put, God takes on human form. It's a three-part miracle. It's, it's a miracle uh, that was divinely inspired by God the Father, the incarnation of Christ. It, it's a, a miracle divinely inspired by God the Father, a miracle which God the Son submitted himself to, and it is a miracle orchestrated by God, the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit came upon Mary. So this first point is a significant point, and that is that Jesus was from the Holy Spirit. Summary point number two is this. Joseph was both just and gracious. I don't necessarily expect you to know what I mean right now by that, but, but let's, let's unpack it. Um, Joseph was both just and gracious. Here's where we're going with this. That is the heart of God toward you. 
And so it's important for us to see that, 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 that Joseph's heart beat both for justice and for grace, because again, that is God's heart toward us. Joseph was both just and gracious. We, we rightly esteem Mary, um, the mother of Jesus. We've been doing that for 2,000 years. We rightly do that because she is esteemed, especially in the Gospel of Luke. But, but here's something that maybe is a little bit uh, less familiar to you. Um, we also rightly esteem Joseph because Joseph is esteemed in this book, in the book of Matthew. Um, I believe we have verse 19. It says, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. That's, that's one aspect of who he is. And, 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 and the law says that, that, that adultery and and, and, and a, uh, a woman who is, who, is, who is engaged to someone, having sex with someone else, that that's just wrong. That's breaking the law. And so, so, so Joseph is committed. He's faithful to the law. But he's also committed and faithful to, to grace. And so it says, and yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. And so what he came up with, I will divorce her quietly. No one has to know, I'll just divorce her quietly. Because he, again, he is committed to justice and to grace. Now, the most natural reading of verses 18 and 19, we just read 19, but verses 18 and 19, the most natural, simple reading, which is how you should normally read your Bible, the most, the most simple reading, it tells us that Joseph found out about the pregnancy when it became obvious about the same time that everyone else found out about the pregnancy. It says that she was obviously showing. And when it became obvious to the general public, to the community, it says she was found to be pregnant. It doesn't mean that, she, that like in some uh, evil way they were hunting her down and finding her to be pregnant. It just means that, 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 that it became obvious. She looked pregnant. And so think on that for just a moment through the eyes and the perspective of Joseph. He has not yet had that dream that you've probably heard about. He's not yet had the dream. We're getting to that. So think on that for a moment. What we know historically, they were betrothed, which means engaged, but it's like engaged on steroids. Uh, so to be betrothed in that day was a very formal agreement, uh, meaning this, that, that, that if they were going to break off their betrothal, their engagement, it required legally a certificate of divorce. Also, if the groom were to die during their betrothal, or this engagement period, then at that point, the bride would, 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 from that point on, be considered a widow. So you see, it's raining. You see, um, the, the point is, the point is, their betrothal is way more formal. It's way more of a formal legal binding agreement than is our modern day engagement, which is an agreement, but it's not a legally binding agreement in our 21st century arrangements. So it's during that season when they're betrothed. All that's left is a period of time has to pass of formality, and then Joseph is to take Mary to his home and they consummate the marriage, and then they are husband and wife. That's all that's left. And during that period of betrothal, Mary is found to be with child. So let me ask you, not out, don't answer out loud, but what would you do if you were Joseph? 
And if one day you see Mary, maybe you see her from the side or you see her profile, and it strikes you, the rumors are right. She is carrying a baby. So Joseph, he's committed to the Old Testament law, and also Joseph, he's a gracious man. He did not want to hurt Mary, even though at this point he thinks that she has hurt him. At this point he thinks that she has cheated on him. At this point his heart is breaking, and yet he does not want to hurt Mary which leads to our third uh, summary statement, which is this. Joseph received a prophetic word from the Lord. Um, we, we, we just read about it. But he actually, if you recall, if you, if you, if you know Matthew 2 and beyond, you know that, that he actually received two prophetic words. At least two times, uh, today's account and in chapter 2, at least two times, Joseph hears a prophetic word, receives a prophetic word from an angel uh, in, a, in a dream. So I'm going to say this. If that's how uh, Joseph, God deals with Joseph just in chapters 1 and 2, I have to wonder, I think this is fine to do, I have to speculate that, that perhaps Joseph, um, during... Jesus' childhood, which is, the Bible is largely silent about Jesus' childhood. Um, perhaps Joseph continued, think on that, continued to hear from the Lord, but prophetically. And so I, I think you know this about me, I want to hear from the Word, from the Lord prophetically. I want to be directed by God in that way. And the question that I contemplated this week, why did Joseph hear from God? Why did God speak to Joseph? It's a profound way on, on, on several occasions. And I believe it to be because God was determined that, that Joseph's actions would, would be divinely orchestrated. That, that, that Joseph's actions would be guided by this supernatural revelation. Why? Why is God so committed to that? Because God, he, he's committed uh, to orchestrate all of Jesus' birth and his early childhood to fulfill the prophecies and the promises of the Old Testament. And so God ensures, determines that will happen by speaking supernaturally, prophetically into God's life. How does that relate to you, to me? Dear friends, when God speaks to you in a profound, supernatural, even prophetic manner, It is a sign emphasizing his commitment to orchestrate your life in a very exact way. I'll go even further than that and say that when God speaks into your life in supernatural ways, clearly directing your path, when God speaks into your life in a prophetic way, it emphasizes, it sheds light on his commitment to orchestrate your life in a way consistent with the storyline of his kingdom that he is writing. So you should rest in that. You should want for that. Let me ask you, do you pray for the gift of prophecy in your own life? Should we ask for that? Should should we want that? 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says this. It's the writing of Paul to the church in Corinth, and he says, 
I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. But that's not what we're talking about today. He says, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, I realize, I realize that, 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 that today, as I speak, some of you haven't a clue what I mean or what Paul means when we talk about prophecy. And, and we're not going to unpack that today. We'll save that. I've preached sermons on that in the past. I will, I will address that more in the future. But I ask you again, do you pray that you might hear from the Lord supernaturally directing your life the way that Joseph hears the Lord say, go this way, not that way. Do you pray that you might receive a prophetic word from the Lord? More and more of my life, more and more of my time is spent asking that I might hear prophetically from the Lord. And I'll say it simply like this. If there is supernatural direction to be had, if that's a real thing, in other words, if I don't just have to use my best judgment, which the Lord has given me, if there is more to be had, then I want more. If there is more to be had by way of the Holy Spirit, then I want more. Summary statement number four. Fear was Joseph's struggle. I want to point that out because that is every one of our struggle. I, I really do believe that is the number one challenge in the life of the believer. Maybe in the life of every human being. But, but in the life of the believer, I believe that is the number one hurdle that we face, that we, that we, that we strive to clear. And, and so I think it, it's, it's good for us to realize that was Joseph's struggle. He had, it seems obvious from this story, from the most natural reading, it seems obvious that he had already determined, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put Mary away quietly. I'm going to divorce her quietly. It seems obvious because then the angel comes and, and says, and says, Joseph, don't, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Some God, sometimes God asks us to do the less than sensible. And that's where a supernatural word from the Lord is necessary. Because sometimes he calls us to do the less than sensible. To, to take the risk. To travel the road less traveled. And when he calls us to that path, in that direction, when we hear from the Lord on those days, one of the ways that you'll know that it's from the Lord is you will always hear this quiet message, don't be afraid. I know this, I know this is risky. Don't be afraid. Now, how, how can we rest in this, this invitation to not be afraid. I believe it starts right here, folks. You need to understand, you need to, to settle this in your own heart. You, you need to come to grips with this truth, and that is God doesn't call us to success or to sensibility or, or even creativity God calls us to faithfulness. God calls us to obedience. And we can do that. At the end of the day, every one of us, we can be faithful. Maybe I've run out of creativity. Maybe I'm not a genius. Maybe I've, maybe I've, I've run amok and I'm not quite as productive as, as I, but I can be faithful. You can be faithful. What was the key 
to overcoming fear in Joseph's life? It was the voice of the supernatural. Again, I compel you, pray. Pray that you might hear the word from the Lord. Which leads to our, our, uh, our, our fifth, our fifth uh, summary statement, which I'm not even going to unpack because I already have, and that is number five, Joseph, he simply obeyed the Lord. He did what the Lord instructed him to do. Number six, Joseph named Jesus. We, we tend to just read right over that and assume, make it a little more complex. It must just mean that this is what you're supposed to name him or this is what you and Mary ought to name him. And I'm not saying that those things aren't true. But, but very specifically in this passage, the angel tells Joseph, you are to name Jesus. You're to name this child, and you're to name him Jesus. Listen, any, and I don't know if you struggle with this or not, but I think some Christians do, any sense that we need not connect Joseph to Jesus as a earthly father because we have some fear that we might be discounting the, uh, the virgin birth, that fear is, is not founded in Scripture because Matthew, in this very passage today, Matthew makes much of the fact that Joseph, you're going to be the adopted daddy of Jesus. Joseph, you are to name him. You get to put this stamp of, this name on Jesus. To name Jesus was to formally acknowledge, this is my son. He's my adopted son, but he's my son. Joseph can claim that boldly. And what did he name him? He named him, he named him Jesus. Why did he name him Jesus? Well, it, it's the Greek form of uh, several names. That in, in, in Hebrew, you could, you could go with Joshua. You've probably heard Yeshua, and some people really like dramatically, overly uh, develop all of that. But it is true that, that, that the angel told Joseph, name him uh, Yeshua, Jesus, Joshua, because in Hebrew, the verb yasha simply means to save. So, so no doubt, no doubt, what's being pointed out here is this is, this is the Messiah, the Christ child, even his name tells us that he will save. The angel says he will save his people from their sins. That's why you are to name him Jesus. The last summary statement from today is this. This is the first example of formula quotations in the New Testament or in the Gospel. It's only the gospel. We're only talking about the gospel of Matthew. It's the first example of the formula quotations. What do I mean by that? It's a, it's a literary device that actually um, happens ten times uh, in the book of Matthew. I'll give you an example, but, but, but let me... Why is that significant? Why am I even pointing, out, pointing that out? Because I want to geek out theologically, maybe, but there's a, there's a deeper sense. There's a, di di uh, a bigger reason... Uh, and that is because it establishes the legitimacy of the incarnation of Christ. It establishes the fact that, that Jesus, the Messiah, will now fulfill all of these Old Testament prophetic promises. Matthew's main point in including these formula quotations uh, ten times in his gospel is to establish Jesus, not just a, as a preacher of God's message, but as the Messiah, to whom the whole Old Testament revelation pointed toward. He's the Son of God. Okay, so, the formula quotation, um, you can look back in your Bible. I'm, I'm just going to find it now. It is verse...
22, it says, all this took place, and this is a formula quotation, formula quotation, to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, quote, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. If you read, maybe you want to do this tonight, if you want to read the book of Matthew, you'll find t- 10 different times Matthew used this, uses the same formula. He says, all this was to fulfill what the prophets told us would happen, and then he gives us a statement. What's he doing? He's just time and time again emphasizing to his largely Jewish audience to whom he is writing, he's emphasizing this fact. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus fulfilled this promise, number one. Jesus fulfilled this promise, number two. And he gives us ten. And so today's Isaiah 7. This is the, the prophecy that he is uh, referencing Verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel. You know it means God with us, the God who moved into the neighborhood, became one of us. Okay, all of that, let's land this plane. What, what, what's the point? What's the significance of this passage? What do I do with this? Walking out of this room... Uh, it's already been tweaking my heart over the weekend. It's always already been calling me to, to, a, to a response. But what is it calling you to? What is the application? Here is what I believe uh, the application should be. I, I believe that God wants to speak much more directly and miraculously in my life than he currently is. I believe that's a process over, my, over the course of my lifetime that will continue to unfold and that God will speak more today than he did yesterday. And I will, I will hear more clearly from him tomorrow than I do today. And I, I want to pray for that. I want to make room for that. I want to make space for that. So the the obvious, the, the, a really good question will be, how do we do that? Pastor Wendy, how do I do that? How do I make more space? How do I make more room that I might hear directly, miraculously, in my life from God? And I believe one of the keys, one of the main keys, is that you must come to grips with the fact that God is not only a God committed to justice, but He is a God of grace. He is a God of forgiveness. That, that He's for me, that He's for you. He is not against you. He does not oppose you. He is not working against you. He is for you. He is 100% for you. He wants the best for you. He wants, like no one else, he wants to give you a word. He wants to speak into your life. He wants to direct your life. He is working, tell yourself, he is working on my behalf. Who's ever heard of a God like that? Historically, throughout time, There has been no other God that has been spoken of in these terms as a God who works on our behalf. It's so profound that the the nation of Israel, they recorded it, and they used to speak of God in this way. Isaiah 64 says this, Since ancient times, no one has heard. No ear has perceived No eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. What's the key here? It's it's the children of God, the posture that we take each and every day as we wait on the Lord. We don't run ahead of the Lord. We don't hurry the process along like Joseph. We say, I I will wait on the Lord. And then when we hear from the Lord, then we say, I can do that. I can be obedient. 
I can be faithful. Wait on the Lord. I was listening to a black, a black pastor, Baptist pastor, preach this weekend. And his words were just stuck with me. He said, he said, let us not put a time limit on the promises of God, on the activity of God in our lives. Let, it, let us wait. Let us wait on the Lord. Let us let us wait on the Lord, trusting that the Lord is one who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. No one's ever heard of a God like that, but, but the God of the Bible, he is that God. And then this black pastor went on. He spoke of his dear his dear deceased great-grandmother, and he said, my great-grandmother used to say, she used to say, the Lord may not come when we want him, but we'll want him when he comes. Let us, let us be a people who, who wait on the Lord. Let us be a people who pray that we might hear more and more often, supernaturally, from the Lord. I want that for me personally. I want that for my family. I want that for you. Let us, let us just simply pray for that right now. If you would bow and pray with me. Lord, Lord, while we are a thankful people that you've, you've given us minds and thoughts and intelligence and abilities, and we're thankful for that. But t today, what we want to acknowledge is that too often we lean too hard on those talents. And what we really want to ask for today is that you would speak, that you would lead, that you would guide, that you would move in our hearts in miraculous ways. That you would give us thoughts to think that are not our own, that, that come from you. You would, you would direct our lives in ways that are at times even counter to our own, our own judgment. We read the story, O oh God, of you, you turning the heart of Joseph In, in a direction that, um, that probably wasn't sensible. Um, but you quietly, you comfort him, comforted him. A and we, we want that in our own lives. We, we've, we've kind of figured out how to make good judgment calls. But oh, that you might... transcend our logic, that you might overwhelm our good judgment. If there's, if there's more, then we want more. We want to hear directly from you. On some weird television-oriented sort of a fashion, but just we want it to be real. We want it to be pure. We want it to be honest. We want it to be supernatural. We, want, we don't want to play games. We just we simply want to hear a word from you, O oh God. Pray that you would deal with us that way, gently and boldly and miraculously, although we might hear from you more and more in the coming days. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.